Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Education interview series. It's Tuesday, May 19th, 2009, and today our topic is the future of online learning. Our guests are Susan Patrick, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, and Tom Cook, a Professor of Occupational and Environmental Health in the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa. Welcome, Susan. Thank you very much. Do you want me to go ahead and get started? No, I'm going to give a short welcome to Tom as well. Welcome, Tom. Uh, welcome, and thanks for the uh, invitation to join this group. Okay, so Tom, show us show us yourself and your tie again, will you? <laughs> okay, if I have to. Here there I you am. go. Okay, in this interview, we're going to be looking at some hot topics in online learning, growth trends and new models for online learning, live medical and diagnostic uses, pandemic and disaster planning, overcoming teacher shortages, and finding new engagement models for today's youth. The session will be about an hour. We'll try and save 15 minutes toward the end for Q&A from the live audience. Both uh, Tom and Susan have provided slides for reference. Uh, Susan and Tom, uh, because of the nature of the timing, if you need me to forward to go forward or back to your slides or something comes up where you want me to find a slide for you, please feel free to let me know. So Susan, I'd like to start with you. You've been preaching online learning and education for a while now. Would you tell us a little bit about your background and where you think we are now in the timeline of adoption? And then feel free to launch into uh, your and prepared presentation. Sure, and thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here as part of the Future of Education series talking about online learning. I'm Susan Patrick. Uh, I'm the CEO of a nonprofit membership association uh, known as iNACL. We are focused on K-12 education and specifically on um, the use of online learning in both blended hybrid environments as well as virtual or distance learning environments. Um, the market for K-12 online learning generally really started, um, and I say the market, when the first online course providers and the first virtual schools started opening up, providing uh, web-based courses and education over the internet, a uh, little more than 10 years ago. The first uh, program started development in 1996 and 1997. By the year 2000, there were about a handful or five states with state virtual schools. You also had some nonprofits such as Virtual High School uh, Global Consortium providing courses across states and a handful of individual schools um, providing on online courses. Today, um, when you compare to the year 2000 when you had those handful of programs serving about 50,000 students, we have 44 states with uh, virtual schools and policies serving more than a million students. That is a very conservative number. It's probably closer to two million when you look at the use of blended and hybrid approaches. And this is across K-12 education. Um, the market, uh, generally, if you look at Clayton Christensen and Michael Horn's work in disrupting class, is just getting started. Uh, this is the beginning of a um, very powerful innovation that is providing a bridge between the old way of doing things and new ways of serving students and engaging students and solving uh, problems that we've had for a long time in education, such as teacher shortages, uh, new ways to provide uh, more modern math and science um, demonstrations, as well as teaching foreign languages and connecting students globally. So. There are a lot of different reasons that schools are engaged in online learning. It is, um, in my mind, the fastest adoption of any innovation inside or outside of technology in K-12 education. It's remarkable how quickly it's growing. It's growing at about 30% a year, 
And as I said, we've just begun. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about future trends once I get into my slides now. So with that, let me go ahead and let's take a look at the emerging um, world of online learning. Just as a, as a reminder, my background um, at INA called this nonprofit, before I came here, I was the director of the Office of Technology at the U.S. Department of Education and authored the National Ed Tech Plan that came out in 2005. Uh, virtual schools and online learning are a centerpiece of the plan, and the ways that they are just changing which students have access to new educational opportunities uh, is truly remarkable uh, when you look across the field. Let's take a quick snapshot. We just talked about some of this. What's happening in online learning? In higher ed, we have about 4 million enrollments in online uh, learning in colleges and universities. 81% of all institutions offer online courses in higher ed. If you look across K-12, the last Sloan C survey that came out last year showed that 70% of school districts in the U.S. have at least one uh, or more students enrolled in a fully online course. So the tide is really shifting although it's uneven from state to state. Only 32 states offer a statewide virtual school that offers supplemental courses, and only 18 states allow for full-time virtual charter schools out of the 50 states. With that, you'll see in this map um, which the states that are in purple have both full-time and part-time opportunities statewide. States that have significant um, part-time or state-led virtual school programs are in the lighter blue. And Wyoming and Oklahoma are both coming on with uh, state virtual schools. What's interesting to me is how far behind uh, New England is in terms of uniformly making available or setting policies so that students can access um, online courses. So what are the benefits or solutions? Clearly, online courses are providing highly qualified teachers to schools where there are teacher shortages. That is one of the main drivers. Um, when the uh, National Center for Education Statistics did a research survey to school districts, the number one reason for offering a course was that the course was otherwise unavailable at their school. This is important to keep in mind when we're looking, um, for those of us in the United States, um, looking at those federal stimulus dollars and the assurances that go with those dollars, one of the key assurances is to provide a solution for changing the distribution um, and, and increasing the number of highly qualified teachers available. In each of the four assurances on those federal stimulus dollars, virtual schools and online learning can be a potential solution. Uh, other ways that virtual schools are helping, helping they're helping students that um, need certain courses. There, there's a huge growth in the last three to five years in students taking online courses for credit recovery as a way to help improve graduation rates. Uh, for students to enroll in online or dual enrollment courses with colleges to help them earn credits while they're still in high school. And I'm going to point to some specific examples about that. But also homebound students and students with special needs who um, need some alternative ways uh, for learning. Online learning um, is in huge demand by students. And to me, this is interesting. We um, we, uh, excuse me, oh, uh, commissioned an, a study of students in middle school and high school to gauge their interest in online courses. 47% of high school students, 44% of middle school students um, across the U.S. were interested in taking an online course. If you compare that to the national numbers of about a million enrollments today, we're serving about 1% of students, and the demand far outweighs um, what we can currently offer just based on the policies and programs that are out there. What are some other interesting bellwethers? 
Michigan is the first state to require an online learning experience in which taking an online course is one way to fill that requirement for their high school graduation requirements. Why? Because they felt in a state that is um, clearly experiencing a very difficult time uh, with the car industry shutting down, with the high unemployment rates, that e-learning is providing uh, training and retraining to the workforce. 30 to 50 percent of workforce training is done through e-learning. 25 percent of college students take at least one online course. The governor says, quote, the need for online learning is greatest with students to access these skills that they will need to get ahead and compete in an increasingly technological workplace. And the demand for that only continues to grow uh, during the downturn in the economy. Let me switch to another state, Alabama. Three years ago, Governor Riley set a goal to deliver high quality AP courses and advanced courses to students in every single high school across the street state and the way they were going to reach that goal was through online learning. But they did it in four ways and I thought this was interesting. The investment of $30 million, which is very substantial, over three years went, went to investing in teacher training to teach online. It went to invest in uh, perpetual licenses or owning the content. But it also went to upgrade the statewide broadband network and put a 21st century classroom in every single high school so that they are showcased in that individual high school's community and that there is a place for every single student across the state of Alabama to go and access everything from Chinese, French, German, Latin to AP calculus, um, macro, microeconomics. Um, the students that never had those opportunities are now able uh, to take classes across the state. And what's amazing is that these students of these rural communities that were at one time isolated are collaborating and working on projects and having discussions with students all across the state. And it's creating a different model for them um, to be able to go after and apply for, for colleges and universities too. So um, I think that Alabama is a great example of what's possible through online learning. A real quick snapshot on the research in K-12 online learning. I mentioned before the number one reason for online learning in K-12 is to expand options. Number two, it's growing rapidly at 30 percent a year. Number three, all of the studies show that it is, quote, students performing equally well or better academically based on student achievement. And number four, it improves teaching, uh, which is a finding from Susan Lowe's at Columbia University. Uh, did a study of teachers that were trained to teach online, and those teachers also trained um, or were taught in face-to-face -face settings. This is consistent with research in higher education that shows when the same instructor teaches online as teaching in a face-to-face, -face, they're taking those technology-enriched skills and moving them back and forth between the two settings so that they not only use um, the internet resources, but they're also using new collaborative approaches, using more of those Web 2.0 tools, and the overall quality of their face-to-face -face course um, improves as well as the teaching becoming more dynamic in the online setting. Uh, this is interesting too. The National Survey for Student Engagement, many of you know this as NESI, from 2008, for the first time ever did, studied um, students, and this is in colleges, taking online courses. The online learners, the students reported deeper approaches to learning than classroom-based learners, and they think that it's because the faculty members, the teachers teaching classes online are making special efforts to engage their students in new ways. Um, that they're not taking engagement for granted, but they showed a higher use of um, or higher activities in terms of students being demanded to use higher order thinking skills, um, to exhibit integrative thinking, and to use reflective learning practices in those classes. 
I'd be happy to make a copy of this presentation available to anybody um, and to follow up and answer any uh, questions on some of these specific studies. So now I'm going to push over, because uh, I'm coming up to my time here um, for my formal presentation. I believe the future is really in blended and hybrid learning. And this research bulletin um, that EDUCAUSE published in 2004 says it best. The idea that you can take the online course resources, uh, the modules, you can train a faculty member or teacher to totally have a different set of skills. But what, what the power of this when you're combining your face-to-face -face class time with fully online components can optimize both environments in ways impossible in other formats. And that is you um, can allow students to accelerate through the curriculum or get more support in different environments through using online tutoring models by having access for the teacher and the student to address specific issues for that student either in front of the class or on a one-on-one -on -one basis using the technology, shifting to the use of online assessments for self um, for, um, acceleration simulations, artificial intelligence, we're seeing some really interesting things happening. The big idea is a fundamental shift in the instructional model and the training. So we're looking at in this arrow here, you can have in the same course a uh, whole series of students. And the higher performing students who are usually more self-directed can still run across a lesson or a particular module. Um, where they need more help, where they're um, needing more direct student support. And a student that often needs more support, say over at the left-hand side, um, start to understand it and need to accelerate. And in the traditional classroom, it's very hard for the teacher to move back and forth across this arrow for each individual student so that these personalized or customized learning environments can be better supported through online learning and the future, I believe, is really in using our class time differently and our resources differently in these blended or hybrid environments. So that blended online learning should be approached not as only a temporal construct, but as this fundamental redesign of an instructional model, as we know it, with the following characteristics. Shifting from lecture to student-centered instruction, shifting from increases in communication between student to student, student to instructor, student to content, student to outside resources, and doing a better job of integrating that formative and summative assessment um, for the instructor, but also for the student. So I'm going to wrap up and just point you to some what I think are some really interesting new models. In North Carolina, uh, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro offers online dual enrollment classes. And so um, in the computer labs, there are high school libraries, uh, high schools all across North Carolina, including some very rural school districts. Um, students are able to start earning college credits without traveling without needing transportation at no cost to the student uh, in high school. And that's been a real motivator. It's also been interesting to see the students that are taking credit recovery or core courses side by side with the students starting to earn college courses and the kind of social dynamic that plays out when they see that they can start um, moving ahead in, um, in college even, even before they fully earn their diploma. Um, we're seeing a similar interesting new model in New Mexico. Their state virtual school is a full P20 e-learning network, and they've got the universities, community colleges, and schools working together, and a number of states creating endorsements through their teacher certification process um, and licensure in online learning. Georgia, Idaho, and Wisconsin are among those. I'm just going to um, go ahead, Steve, and we'll Move forward, um, if, if I was going to talk about some of those global issues and we can come back to the uh, pandemic um, preparedness, I can touch on that real quickly. Um, I also have some slides in here on federal stimulus and how it relates to online learning, but I'll just make those available uh, through, through the slides. I think one really interesting example, especially right now when we're looking at these issues with 
um, pandemic preparedness, the swine flu, as schools are shutting down around the country. I have been, um, I was on a committee uh, post Katrina and co chair the P pandemic and disaster preparedness committee of the health team. And I think there's a really interesting report that um, is very well done. If Singapore has been doing this disaster planning um, using e-learning for over 10 years now, and they specifically hold 100% uh, of their secondary schools use online learning in blended environments and virtual environments. 100% of their teachers are trained to teach online. And if this seems overwhelming, this is starting to happen in a lot of different countries. Um, I'm pushing this out because I think we're really far behind in terms of where other countries are. When they put in their pandemic preparedness and their disaster preparedness plans, they have two things that they look at. One is about closing schools or social distancing to prevent the spread, but number two, they put in measures to ensure the continuity of learning, and that is how do students continue to receive their education when the school doors are shut? And the answer to that is through the Internet. And so if we set up these models, we can do all the things I was talking about in the beginning of the slides where we get the benefits of online learning, but we have to think about how we do our disaster planning, not as a separate thing where we just shut down schools and leave kids out on their own. But look at it as a model for maintaining that community, maintaining a communication system, but most importantly, ensuring the continuity of learning. So that report, um, and you can get links to any of these, but this is real, real quick. On the steps for schools, number one, you should be reviewing your past disaster plans. Number two, you should include these continuity of learning goals during school closures through online learning. That means you need to train for online delivery. That means your administrators, teachers, and do an assessment of Internet access from home for your students and for your staff. And number three is communicate to set the expectations for telecommuting and online learning during the school closures. Uh, some school systems are practicing during winter or weather school closures and doing drills with e-learning day. Um, what Singapore does is every year they physically shut schools down for a week and they call that e-learning week and that is a disaster preparedness measure so that they can um, maintain those um, academic learning but as well as staying in touch with the families. So the last point on this is disaster and pandemic plans, how you do academic continuity. Um, these plans should include virtual learning. Continuity of essential services during pandemic plan does require significant training and changes in your day-to-day -day work operations. And you want to be making those changes up front, not when you start thinking about shutting schools down. When you look at telecommuters and having school children learning online, this requires access to the Internet, both for work and online education. Um, so you need to have a handle on the broadband capabilities in your community as well. So on your checklist, um, make sure that you have an emergency plan with this continuity of learning and you establish and have ready access to online courses. This will help you. Um, you can either provide them with your own institution or partner to provide them. And again, if you do this, you'll be meeting all of these different areas. So Steve, I think that's pretty much what you wanted me to hit on in terms of the future of online learning, and I'd uh, like to shift over and, and give Tom a chance to talk about uh, his slides, too. There's a lot of other information um, anybody can follow up. So thanks so Susan, much. Susan, that was great. We're, we're going to give you a little intermission clap now, the equivalent of a stretch break. Uh, I'm going to turn my camera back on because I did put this tie on for a reason. So in this short moment, I get to wear the tie. Uh, I want to ask one quick follow-up question before we move to Tom. Um, I interviewed Michael Horn from Disrupting Class a couple of weeks ago, and did I got the definite feeling that the, the concept behind the book was this technology will not come in through the front door of schools. But it sure looks to me like it is coming in through the front door. How do you respond to that? Did, did you agree with Disrupting Class, or did you find that, in fact, the public school system was going to be able to adopt this uh, through the front door? That's a great question, and it's a little bit of both. Um, there are no simple answers on this. It's both in the way that 
Um, it's being adopted most readily at the state level um, with the state virtual schools, and there are only 32 states that do that. In the sense that it looks like it's coming through the front door, but it's not coming through the front door, there aren't a lot of times when your state education agency is directly hiring teachers and making courses available statewide, like it is in Georgia or Alabama or other places. Um, when you look at that number of 70% of school districts offering online courses, an awful lot of those are coming through the state virtual schools, which following the series and disrupting class have been set up as separate entities designed to serve the student in a student-centered focus. Um, asking every one of the 15,000 school districts in the U.S. to create their own virtual school from scratch is a lot of work in a place where there's not a funding model. So the yes and no is that it does follow the theories of disrupting class and that they're being set up in these somewhat different outside of the box agencies, but what's really nice is that they can bridge right into the school district if the right policies are in place for the kids taking the class. So I hope that, that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah, I think it does. And, and thanks for being sensitive to Tom's time. So Tom, you're more focused on health issues. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and then could you paint a brief picture for us of the state of online technology and the work that you've been doing? Uh, sure. Thanks very much, Steve. And, and uh, again, thanks for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, session. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, and thanks, Susan, too, for the segue into sort of public health issues with the pandemics and um, influenza and such. Uh, I'm, I'm with the College of Public Health, the University of Iowa, um, and primarily concerned with international health or global health. You know, we, we have a little slogan that all health is global, and I think things like the flu pandemic and, and uh, cross-border pollution and, and lots of other issues, there's certainly a, a, an increasing awareness of our interconnectedness, certainly on the health front. So um, I, my background is I'm uh, actually an engineer by training and a physical therapist, so one of these hybrid kind of people, and I've uh, been in the College of Public Health here at the University of Iowa for 20 plus years and doing international work for uh, well over the last 15 years. Um, and I, I get around a lot in terms of other places. Uh, what I'd like to do briefly, and I know this isn't in line with many of your interests, um, in terms of uh, K through 12 education in the U.S., but uh, it, it does provide a continuum, I think, um, from the U.S. to to the uh, the global perspective. We've been working on an initiative here uh, that we call the Global Public Health Campus, and I'll give you just a, a brief sort of rationale as to what's going on and, and what we're interested in doing. We've been using um, online web conferencing now for uh, almost four years, and of the and these are the sort of the laundry list of applications. Uh, we use almost all of these uh, in one way or another, but the main things I wanted to uh, focus on here is this global knowledge sharing and uh, medical consultations is what uh, Steve asked me to, uh, to focus on. The reason we're interested in educating health workers globally uh, is uh, based primarily on this World Health Organization report from 2006 which identified on a country-by-country -country basis the shortage of health workers. And this includes nurses, physicians, uh, community health workers, sanitarians, um, educators, and such. And uh, the number comes out to be well over 4 million health workers just to meet the minimum that's uh, uh, been clearly identified statistically to uh, provide uh, the, the absolute minimal health uh, services. Um, so there's a major crisis in most of the world, and in particular on this map you see the dark orange countries, and these are the 37 countries that the World Health Organization has identified as having uh, what they call critical shortages of health workers. Um, in many cases, some of the countries in Africa have less than 100 doctors and millions of, of, of people in population. So these countries are particularly uh, struggling with health workers. Now, they're poor countries. They have little in the way of infrastructure in terms of schools. They have um, uh, very little in the way of faculty to train more health workers. So the question becomes, how can we use technology 
uh, information technology to meet these these uh, really critical needs. Try to remember this um, this little pattern here. Let me see if I get the right. Try to remember this pattern in Africa, the pattern of these countries, the dark orange countries that uh, represent uh, a large number of the really critically needy countries in terms of health education and health information. Uh, also, if you look, uh, we'll focus on Africa as an example here. It, these are the submarine cables that carry the internet around the world. Susan mentioned about access to broadband and how important that might be with disaster planning and distance education and such. But if you look at the number of cables, uh, the number of uh, megabits, uh, gigabits that can be connected in, in between different continents, if you look at some of these really uh, information poor countries, you see that uh, they have much less connectivity. In fact, um, only about 20% of the world's population has any access to the internet. And if we look at uh, Africa uh, in the purple here, we see that they represent only 3% of the world's internet users, and actually only uh, a little less than 5% of the world's population of the population in Africa has any access to the internet whatsoever. So we run against uh, some major limitations in trying to apply what we do in developed countries to these most needy uh, countries um, uh, you know, in different parts of the world. This is a lot of information, I know, but let me uh, tell you what each of the numbers are in these countries in Africa. The top number is the uh, uh, number of internet users per thousand population. And the um, bottom number is the cost of an internet connection as a multiple of average salary. So for example, in the Central Republic of Congo, only two out of a thousand people have any access to the internet, and an internet connection, slow though it be, uh, costs nine times the average uh, annual salary. And in general, you see along the coast where the submarine cable uh, and the internet arrives uh, a little better off, the people in the southern tip of Africa are a little better off, and the people across the northern tier are a little better off because they have greater proximity to the uh, to the internet. Uh, here, here's an interesting uh, comparison. We call this a bit of a, a this is a paradox. These are the countries I showed you before that have the greatest need for health workers and for health information and health education. And these dark orange countries are the countries that have less than 1% of the population with access to the internet. Kind of a, uh, an eerie similarity of, of these two patterns. Um, so we started a number of years ago using um, technology like we're using now, and that is basically low bandwidth web conferencing. Um, and we've actually been amazed at how well the technology can work even in these uh, really um, marginal uh, conditions in which the internet is scarce and the internet is expensive and the internet is slow. So um, the, the major feature that we need to deliver health education online and health information is a system that, um, that allows uh, us to do this over very poor internet uh, conditions as I just pointed out. So that's sort of the background of what we've been trying to do. And uh, here at the uh, University of Iowa, as part of our, our mission to help educate more health workers globally, we've been working with a large number of organizations. Um, I'll point out a couple here. Uh, I'll give you an example of briefly. The World Health Organization, um, you see some of the others here. The uh, Ann Sullivan Center in South America that deals with pediatric disabilities, the Afro-European Medical Research Network, and one of the projects we run out of the University of Iowa here related to, to Clubfoot. But basically, we provide the connectivity, the information infrastructure through our uh, web conferencing system, this Illuminate system, to these different professional organizations who do the connecting and do the training and do the educating. Uh, let me um, show you a little uh, YouTube video. Give me about 10 seconds to type in the, uh, the URL. Assuming I can type with a tie on. Um, Tom, I have it prepped if you want me to pull it up. Uh, okay, I think I've got it here. Uh, well, I thought I did. If you've got it prepped, go ahead and pull it up there, um, uh, Steve. I put it in, but it didn't seem to like it. 
Oops. So the way this will work is you'll have to let this play on your own computer. Tom, if you closed it down or Susan did it, uh, closed it for everybody. Yeah. Did, did it go away for yeah, everyone? Yeah, it must have. Let, give me give me one second here. I can pull it back up. All right, I'll let you do it then. Go ahead. So at least on my machine, it started auto playing, so it's playing for me right now. Yep, I got it here. Uh, if anybody else has it. Go ahead and click a smiley face if you're seeing this. Okay, basically what you see then, it looks like everybody's seeing it, thanks. Uh, every place you see a little icon of a computer guy, uh, these are places that we have connected in the last 10 months as part of this sort of um, consortium of educa health educators. Uh, you see that we are able to connect to some of these fairly obscure, uh, limited uh, access places in Africa. Certainly the people in, in Europe and the different organizations we work with there have great connectivity. Uh, we've been able also to connect to some sites in the Middle East, to uh, East Africa, uh, to Southern Africa, again, the places that are a little better connected. Certainly the internal countries in Africa are almost unreachable with this technology. And we've done, uh, we do a number of connections in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, the Western Pacific, um, and um, a couple little islands there in, uh, in the uh, Western Pacific. Um, and that just gives you some idea of the places we've been able to reach with this technology. Let me give you three quick examples of what of organizations we're working with, and then we'll um, we'll go on to the, the question and answer thing. Um, one of the groups we work with, for example, is the Afro-European Medical Research Network. Uh, they're located out of Bern, Switzerland. They're a group of expatriate physicians and public health people who uh, connect not only with us here in Iowa, but the Canadian Public Health Association and the various countries you see in Africa. In fact, I, I tuned in this morning to see what was happening, and they had a session in French uh, originating from a Canadian group to uh, most of these countries in Africa. They have uh, weekly sessions in which they do, uh, uh, they cover a number of uh, medical and public health topics with the um, various health institutions in uh, some of the countries you see on this map. Uh, this is some work we do with the World Health Organization. This is a, a screenshot of a conference that we originated from Kampala, Uganda last March. You can see we had 24 sites from Philippines, India, and uh, various other places. Uh, and the bandwidth was low enough that we could only get uh, a very sketchy black and white uh, webcam, but we got one. And we had a two-hour session over a 13 kilobit line, which, which surprised uh, us as well as uh, the company, but it worked quite, uh, quite nicely. So we do a lot of these uh, collaborative things. We do a lot of discussions, a lot of planning meetings in conjunction with the World Health Organization and their six regional offices. And then um, one of the groups that's really taken off with this uh, technology uh, is a, the uh, Ann Sullivan Center in Lima, Peru, a center for children with special needs. Um, and they conduct uh, Saturday morning seminars for about three hours. They connect to as many as 32 or 34 sites throughout Latin America. Uh, and they will have as many as 1,500 participants when they have audiences at each of these 30-some sites and discuss topics like um, uh, autism, Down syndrome, and other issues related to, uh, to pediatric disabilities in their effort to change attitudes and to change policies into, in terms of how these different uh, governments and societies deal with um, um, special needs uh, children. And then on the clinical consultation side, although I know uh, some of this technology was never designed to do telemedicine, the application sharing features uh, make it uh, quite nice for that. This is one example of how you might put um, uh, various digital images on um, uh, as part of the application sharing along with the webcam. And in particular, these are some shots from uh, a consultation that uh, are related to clubfoot or children that were born, as you see here, with um, with this foot deformity. There are about 600,000 kids a year born like this. Uh, this 
problem can be corrected with some um, plaster cast and some other bracing in a matter of a couple months their feet can look like this instead of like this. This actually is the same, the same child. Uh, and we regularly, regularly do consultations from our medical staff here at the University of Iowa uh, to various locations around the world when the physicians have problem cases. And uh, this was a screenshot from January 15th in which we had 40 doctors at a uh, uh, conference in Delhi, India, and uh, we had several hours of consultation with these problem cases from our medical staff here at the University of Iowa, and they could discuss the cases and, and provide the advice based on, on their experiences. So briefly, that's, uh, that's what we've been doing uh, um, in terms of trying to provide health education and health information to, uh, to developing countries around the world. So I'll kick it back to you, Steve. Okay, so Tom, that was fascinating. I'm, I'm going to take another clap break for you. Please feel free to click on the little hand with the, the red uh, dots at the end to indicate you're clapping. Tom, that was fascinating to me. Uh, I'm curious, have you read Disrupting Class, the Clayton Christensen um, book? Uh, no, I have to uh, confess I haven't. Okay, well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but Susan, if you're still listening, uh, it seems to me that what Tom described is very much in harmony with the message of that book, which is that where there aren't other alternatives, these technologies provide a simple, maybe not fully complex solutions, but they do offer a solution that otherwise um, doesn't exist. So do you think that we are seeing things, Tom and Susan, that are happening on this global stage with this kind of technology that will have a positive impact and benefit were there to be a pandemic that, that in fact in North America shut us down? Well, Steve, one point that's interesting is after the education book, Clayton Christensen wrote a book on healthcare. It's his last one to come out, and so that may be worth checking out. And kind of the one, one of the big ideas on um, his definition of innovation is that it uses technology to be disruptive, and I think that's exactly in line with uh, Tom's message and, and what we're getting across here. Thanks. Tom, do you see any lessons yeah, from sure. your work that apply? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I think for sure. Um, the um, um, what we find out when we look at what kind of information to um, you know the people in in these really uh, low resource developing countries, what kind of health information do they want? Um, they're not really into brain surgery or MRIs or high level diagnostics. They have they they, they don't have that technology. They're into really basic health information about hygiene and and prenatal care and wound care and and you know what what to do with the really primary what we call primary care health issues, and certainly part of that is uh, is uh, what to do when there's a flood, when there's a tsunami, when there's when there's a drought, you know when when uh, those sorts of things. So I think disaster preparedness and and how to go about um, managing the health issues associated with that is a is of keen interest to the um, you know to the health providers and, and the public health people in these developing countries, so it, it's it's right up front because it's it's real to them in terms of what they um, you know what they have experienced and probably will continue to experience based on you know climate change and some of the things that are happening. So while we're preparing to shift to the Q and A, I'm going to put in the chat some resources that Beth Golub from Illuminate. Um, sent to me as part of a FAQ she's developing on um, educate academic continuity or uh, continuation. Uh, I think these might be of interest, and they'll they'll be in the uh, recording of the chat log as well. So um, let's go ahead and shift to Q and A. I see a couple of hands have been raised. I don't know if you did that thinking you were clapping. There is a button to the left that's a hand with a green arrow up. And if you have a question you'd like to ask by microphone, please feel free to click on that. Suzanne and Jay Soder, if that was your intent, please feel free to leave your hand up and I'll call on you. Um, Susan, there was a question that came up from Corey Plow that I think was during your session. He says, in the blended learning model, do you think the primary instruction comes from the online portion rather than the face-to-face? 
Corey, when you look at definitions of blended learning, it's usually between 25% and 75% of a shift of online or face-to-face. -face. So it's hard to say that the majority comes from one or another. There are a lot of different models. And if you wanted to follow with me directly, I'd be happy to talk to you about what some of those models look like. But that would really be a separate webinar, too. So thanks for the question, but it just depends. So it occurred to me, Susan, I didn't think of it for this interview, but there was an article that came out this week about that showed a study that showed that students who listened to podcast lectures actually did better on the exams than students who attended the physical lecture. Are we finding something very interesting out here, which is that sometimes the kind of social interactions or pressures that might be associated with a physical environment um, in fact can, can hinder learning? And so is that uh, a little bit of the surprise of online learning is that it sometimes, like you said, actually produces better results? You know, what's interesting, Steve, when you mentioned that article on podcasts, um, I'm part of a technical working group for the U.S. Department of Ed looking at a whole history of studies of learning and online learning. And the one area that keeps coming up that shows a positive student outcome is not just from the use of technology, um, actually across a number of technologies, but there's a positive correlation with learning when the user is given control of that technology. And if you're comparing a lecture to a podcast of the same lecture, what's different is that, and I think Deirdre's pointing that out, that if a student misses something, they can go back, rewind, fast forward. It's that user control piece in the technology that I think is part of what makes online learning so powerful, but it's probably um, the indicator that's coming out in that um, study of the podcast, too. Yeah, I think we, we may be seeing um, those effects uh, specifically there. So I, I, this is a good conversation. And Joyce, I think it is your daughter, Adora, right, uh, that you're referencing there. Um, I don't know if you wanted to take the mic and comment, but you would certainly be welcome to. OK, so uh, do we yeah. have any other questions from the group? Oh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make add a comment about the uh, the podcast and a comment in the chat here about a podcast is something the students can listen to on their own time and sort of be control of uh, versus a class where you have to go and and what we find with our recordings of our sessions like we you know this illuminate session uh, it's interesting the students prefer the recorded session so I guess it goes along with that podcast notion they almost uh, we, we prefer to skip the class and to view the recording on their own time rather than to attend class. And we actually uh, put in some incentives to get them to, to really show up. But I think it's the same idea as, as uh, some individuals much prefer to, to control when and where they take in the information as opposed to um, you know, doing it on someone else's schedule. I, I would I also add that with our foreign students and a lot of our circumstances, the idea of having a recording in which you could, as, as I think Susan mentioned, you can fast forward, rewind, hear it again. That's particularly true if the, if the material is being presented in a language that is not your native language. Uh, so our foreign students and the international people we work with really take to the idea of being able to replay uh, selected sections of, uh, of a lecture or a presentation. While we're queuing up the next question, uh, Tom, what I find interesting about that is I, I did watch a very in compelling interview with two students who were doing a language learning um, in an illuminated environment or an online environment. And it wasn't recorded, it was live, but they still felt that that experience was significantly better than it had been when they were actually in a regular classroom. So I, I think it's interesting how these different threads uh, may all combine together. Scott uh, McLeod, you had a question, but I didn't see the original one in the chat. So if I give you the mic, would you like to ask it? Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through. Yes, you're coming through. Uh, great. Uh, hi, Susan. I'm just curious if you could talk for just a minute about who you think is maybe doing a good job of preparing teachers to teach online.
Thanks, Scott. That's a great question. Um, I think more and more of school districts and states and even uh, universities through their schools of education are starting to ask that question um, and also starting to build not only courses but whole certificate programs around that. I think a really good example of a program that does an excellent job of training teachers to teach online uh, there are a couple of them. One is Boise State University in their masters, um, specifically in their masters of ed tech, but they have a whole certificate program in online teaching. They actually teach all of Connections Academy teachers across the country. Um, that's a full-time online virtual school program. Another great example is Virtual High School. Uh, which is a nonprofit 501c3 run out of Massachusetts, has several courses where they uh, train teachers to teach online, train teachers um, in higher level courses to do course development work if you want to do that. Um, both SREB and INACL, um, our organizations make a number of resources available um, through Illuminate webinars and other uh, resources. We've done teacher training with Chicago uh, for blended learning and some other schools. So there are more and more people um, making available professional development to train teachers how to teach online and I can help people point. Uh, University of Wisconsin uh, does have an excellent program uh, to thank you for, for mentioning that. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so, Alyssa, if you had a question, please feel free to take the mic. Uh, if you don't, then we'll we'll uh, let Noble do that. Oh, good. Go ahead. I I do have a question. You know, it's so exciting to think that students um, can learn without having to attend um, physically in a building in a face-to-face -face class. And I think it right now, as far as funding goes, the state departments, um, at least in Missouri, are not yet. Um, passing any legislation that would allow districts to receive funding for online students. I think there's something on the floor, but just wondering what the what it looks like nationally uh, in other districts and other cities as far as funding from state departments for online learning uh, versus seat time. Alyssa, that's, this is Susan. That's a great question and that is uh, what makes up a big deal of our time in terms of advocacy. Uh, when I showed you that map earlier um, in reference, 44 states have states and policies specifically addressing online learning. Several states do not and the biggest single issue is that funding and seat time issue for average daily attendance. Uh, there's a bill in the California legislature right now uh, taking a step to address that. States like New York have not addressed it. Um, states like Florida have addressed it and have moved to competency-based models. Um, the report that Evergreen Consultants and that we're part of called Keeping Pace with K-12 Online Learning outlines the 50 states and their policies related to that. It's a huge, um, it's a huge issue and it's being addressed in different ways basically depending on how uh, state education and finance policy is set up. Thanks. For that response. Noble, did, Thank you. Noble, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, the whole um, idea, maybe uh, Susan, you want to comment on this, on not so much um, online education but online interaction. Uh, I run Teachers Without Borders Canada and we do work in Kenya as well as South Africa and we're doing a lot of ICT training uh, for teachers. Uh, one of the things that, you know, like for, through Skype is um, video conferencing and get in classrooms and to talk and see each other. So the whole idea of, of bringing a global perspective, infusing it throughout the curriculum through these kind of interactions are so powerful. So using online for the interactive purpose as well. And the other question, I think um, Tom probably could answer this as well, um, you know, not being bogged down by connectivity but still allowing access through things like the e-granary. Um, so using methods like that that could be worked offline but still model e-learning skills and uh, teaching those skills to students and, t and teachers. So if either want to respond to either question, it would be great. 
Well, I'll just jump in here. Thanks for your, your question. In terms of sort of the computer literacy issue, um, you know, when we uh, when we do when we sort of break into a new site uh, in a developing country, we have people who who um, uh, you know really lack even the basic uh, concepts or, or haven't been exposed to the basic concepts of uh, of using a computer. You know, we find that it takes several sessions. Um, you know, just to navigate the screen and just to get over the fear that you might, you know, that you're not going to break the computer and such. So uh, um, we, we just expect that it's going to take um, usually about three sessions before uh, people even become comfortable enough to turn on the microphone and say a very cautious hello, you know. So I think, uh, I, I think that's fundamental. You really need to go through those um, those stages of, um, of computer literacy, if you will, before you can get beyond that and then talk about uh, talk about content. Susan, did you want to respond? Uh, no, I I agree with it. that answer. I don't have anything to add. Thanks. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes left uh, while we're waiting for some additional questions. I'm going to put the survey link up for this session. It sure helps us if you give us some feedback on how we've done uh, and so we can be better prepared for future events. Um, you'll, I also will give a thanks at this point to KnowledgeWorks Foundation, who are a sponsor of the interview series, and to Illuminate, of course, for their providing this room and, uh, and for being so generous as to actually hire me um, we've got coming up uh, this month still Gary Putland from Australia, Michael Wesch, Chris Deedy, John Seeley Brown, and David Thornburg. They may be bumped into June. But uh, please uh, go ahead and fill out the survey, and then we've, well, we've got time probably for one more question if anyone has one. Okay, so uh, Noble, I think your hand is still up, but I'm going to assume that you're, you are done. So uh, I want to give a uh, thanks to Susan Patrick and Tom Cook. I'm using the clapping hand to indicate my appreciation. Thanks to you who have attended. Um, Tom and Susan, if you wouldn't mind, uh, don't close that window down with a survey because it will actually close it down for everyone else. But thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Tom and Susan, that was a, f a fantastic session. Um, so much uh, there to absorb. The recordings and the links will go up on the site later today. Uh, so we appreciate uh, having access to all that information. So thanks, Susan, and thank you, Tom. Okay, thanks to all of you for your attention, and thanks for this, uh, this opportunity. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. So Michael Wesh is coming up on May 26th, and you can see that schedule at futureofeducation.com. Joyce, you didn't find that link to uh, for the Illuminate session with uh, Adora, did you? If not, I'll go look for it and try and post it in the chat before I turn the recording off. So Jeff, the answer is that we actually save a version of the chat in a rich text format, RTF, and you can pull that into any word processor and print it out. Tom, I'm going to leave the recording going just for a little bit more because I want to get the uh, Illuminate link to Adora. Um, Joyce, I hope I'm saying the last name right, Svitax, Svitax um, session that she did in Illuminate just this past week.
Okay, thanks again to Tom and Susan. I'm going to turn the recording off.